Good morning, and thank you for having invited me to talk to all of you at Paperworks. I um, will be calling this talk Going Forward, Looking Back, because when, you, when I was asked to do this, I went through most of my, a uh, lot of my slides and had them transferred to images, and I began to realize how much work I had done on paper and how much work I'd done in traditional media. Um, this image that you're looking at right here is called Land Ho, and it is an outtake from a larger painting uh, that I did in the twenty in the in the twenty in the two thousands, and um, I, I think it just uh, is a metaphor for going forward. And the title of the painting is Land Ho. I was not originally, uh, I did not originally study art in college. I studied, I was a literature major, but I always took studio art and art history. And then when I moved to Phoenix from California with my husband, and I was having, raising a family and busy uh, with that, I began to do work with tie-dye. It was the 70s, that was popular. And I began to adapt tie-dye to doing, um, a lot of bleached and wrapped fabric and sometimes clamped. This first one that you're looking at is from Five Yards of Black Silk, which I bound, bleached, and then over dyed it with the orange. And the other, this other is a, a large quilt that I did. Uh, in this case, I just folded and clamped it and then pieced the border and this, uh, the biggest of the quilts I did called House of Mirrors was actually, for the most part, pieced. I folded and clamped with the images of the figures, uh, which were cut out, as I recall, out of um, probably some sort of masonite, and then uh, began to piece the quilt together. And then as things went along, my husband had, a, had taken over a small family business and all family businesses inv inevitably begin to involve the family. So I went, began to work in the business. And during that time, I also began to take a series of classes in the painting curriculum at ASU. Um, I was drawing on the weekends, on Sundays, with a group of artists and from life and nude. And so I began to take those figures uh, and work them into some kind of an imagery. Around that time, I talked to uh, Henry Schobel, who was the, one of the professors, the painting professors at ASU, said I might want to go to graduate school. And he said, well, if you do, you should go get a studio and just paint. And so I did get a studio in Scottsdale on Marshall Way with another student. And I painted on weekends, and he painted during at night, he was working during days. <clears throat> and I took these figures that I'd been using, drawing from life, and I began to do the icons of American womanhood. This is Pink Lady, an all-American girl. I did Wonder Woman and Wonder Woman 2. And I used the shoulder pads and some of the, I began to really make these um, surrealistic. Um, and I also did all American Girl Ham and Egg, where I took the images of ham and egg and made them part of the girl's body and Malibu Barbie and Malibu Barbie I grew up in Los Angeles I went to the beach all the time and so this was sort of my um, homage to, <laughs> to the beach I also began to paint in oil I had been mostly those earlier drawings were all done in pastel on paper um, they are probably oh about 18 by 24 maybe and uh, so then I began to transfer the work, or do some work on uh, canvas and oil. And these two, uh, the first is called Paper Dolls, based on a photo that my sis of my sister and, and me when we were very young. Um, and I just restricted myself by using color. I'd seen a Picasso painting, I liked the colors. And so I often did that to try to uh, see how I could use a set of colors and it gave me a structure and a form. And then this is for Cezanne Bathers, which was a kind of joke on my part. I had called ASU Library to get a book on Cezanne, and 
<laughs> with the computer voice, uh, said yes, I had ordered four Saz and Bath Ers. And I just, I've always liked to use a little humor in painting, and so that's what I included here. By then it was the 1990s, and uh, there was a lot going on uh, in imagery for women. I was a feminist, uh, and so I didn't like the fact that the models were you were skinny. They called them the heroin models, and young girls were getting bulimia and becoming anorexic. And so I did a series of drawings. These are all charcoal with pastel uh, that I called Flaca y Rubia, thin and blonde. Um, and then the last of these drawings of the feminist icons was She's Perfect Big Chest. And that was because I had, um, I'd been hiking on Piastoa Peak and heard some guys talking and one of them said his girlfriend was perfect. She had a big chest. And that made me think a lot about women and the various kinds of jobs they have and the drawers in their lives. We have a lot of different, uh, different uh, ways that we are required to act. And so that was my, uh, my take on that. And La Reina Sta Muerta. Um, you know, it's always interesting when you move. Um, and so this is from 1997, and here's what happened. Uh, the city of Scottsdale condemned the building I was in on Marshall Way. And when a city does that, they actually have to compensate you. So every now and then you have some luck in as an artist. I mean, you work hard your whole life. And every now and then you get a little bit of luck. And this was a piece of luck for me because I was able to move my studio to Indian School Road where there were four other artists working who had were associated with ASU. It was much closer to my home, so much easier to get to. And that sort of led me to begin to do some new work and change the focus. And so I had gotten interested in the work of Jennifer Bartlett, Bartlett who was a conceptualist painter, and she would assign herself things. This was probably in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, and then do a whole lot of paintings based on the assignment. So, of course, in Phoenix, everybody has a swimming pool. Not everybody, but, you know, swimming pools are ubiquitous. And so I thought, well, I'll take this swimming pool I look at in my backyard every day and see what I can do with it. And I did all these paintings I called poolside, and I just numbered them. They are gouache on paper. I think the paper is probably maybe squarish, so I'm getting I'm guessing 18 by 20. And I used ink, and I used um, probably some, um, I'm thinking some pastel too, or colored pencil. And I just took pool imagery and began to abstract it and to fracture it. So the images I had been working with, which were cartoons earlier, the women, um, I no longer was using an image in whole, but instead was taking it apart and reforming it so that I got fractured surfaces. And I still used lots of symbols from what you see at a swimming pool. There were umbrellas and chairs and inner tubes and plants. Um, there was diving boards and all kinds of pool toys. And I think I did about 30 of these. And then I began, as I, I began to stretch with it, um, I began to seek other ways to represent this. This is the only collage that I think I did of this series. And I, in looking in my slides and having them converted, I liked the simplicity of it. And I think the painting on the left is probably I'm going to say a um, an oil on canvas that I did. I didn't do too many of those. I mostly did gouache on paper. I then, and I also did, of course, some very geometric uh, imagery, pool lanes, and then this generalized swimming pool was on the cover of Phoenix Downtown Magazine when I did it. The last of those paintings during the 90s was this set of poolside paintings that are dots. 
Uh, these are, I took graph paper and I did dotted uh, colors and I gave myself the restriction that no dot, you couldn't do more than one dot at one place. This was a Jennifer Bart Bartlett uh, trick and I thought it was fun. It was very much not the kind of painting I did, but it was an interesting restriction. And I think that this ended up being quite meditative, which I liked. I came back to this poolside in about 2018. And during that time, uh, there were a lot of calls at various uh, museums for 12 by 12 paintings, uh, small paintings. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I'll try my hand at that. This is actually uh, not a, it's a 12, it's two 12 by 12s. So it's 12 by 24, uh, a, a diptych. And I did this at, in an abstract way, but not fractured. I liked the idea of seeing the image and seeing how the various forms could connect. Here's poolside green umbrella and uh, two swimming pools. This was where there was a spa and pool. And then I almost always, if I was doing water, I would get ocean in because that's, I did grow up where there's, of course, at the beach and where there's ocean. This particular painting from the dock also includes a buoy and this is actually an outtake, and later you'll see where I got some of these outtakes from the larger paintings I was doing. Here's another one, the red chair, you'll probably see again. So by then it was 2001, and uh, there was a call in Phoenix for sculpture, and it was for the Great Phoenix Meltdown. And I thought, I'd never done an installation. I thought it would be very interesting to try. I was interested in miking something so that I could get sound. And so my husband, Ned, built a steel table for me and with little holes for each of the ice blocks that we were using and built a soundboard. And then I went out and, uh, and we bought my microphones. And then I went out and rented a mixer and a couple of big speakers. And I did this uh, to include sound and also to get something random and meditative. And I'm going to just play it for you so that you can hear the silence of it. in my studio on Indian School Road for a first Friday. I had people there who were visitors and I would give them a lighter and they could melt the ice if they wanted to go the sound to go faster. But I think you get the idea that the actual drumming sound is the randomness of the ice dripping and the fact that it's being put through a sound mixer. So that was 2001, and of course, in many ways, you prefigure, artists do, what's going to happen. And I think that um, that's what happened here. That working with the sound was this meditative um, effort. Um, there's an artist that I like very much who's from Texas. His name is David Bates, and he says, the path between what you see and what you paint is filled with your life. And so in a way, I think that particular installation prefigured what would happen uh, in 2001 in September, because that was the, that was September 11th, when the Twin Towers were bombed. And following that, 
I felt compelled to do another installation, which was a set of 125 ink and brush drawings of figures. I called it 400 falling figures. There are 25 uh, folios. And I, that was my way of honoring everyone who had been touched by this awful event. Each figure is different. Um, I let the ink drip. I did it on the wall. Uh, I had the paper cut specifically to a narrow format. I went to Arizona Art Supply to have that done. And then I just stuck it on the wall and began painting. And it was about probably a month's worth of painting. And it was meditative. Um, so I'll show you a couple of, of close-ups. One of them uh, is interesting. You'll see that I have, I did not want these to be framed. I wanted them to hang loosely. And so at the time, it wasn't easy to go on the web and order things. So I just drove all over Phoenix from the west side to the east side to fabric stores getting black grain ribbon, which I wanted to uh, use as a hanging device. And then I hung them first in Marilyn Zappo's studio. That was the last slide you saw, uh, where she photographed them. She's a wonderful photographer and did my copy art at the time. And then uh, they hung at Carolyn Commons once. They, and part, part of this hung at another location downtown in Phoenix. But really and truly, since then, it's pretty much been in a box in my studio stored. Um, and so that sort of, as those things happen, you come to endings. And I began, when I did go back to painting, I began to do some very large figure drawings and big paintings. This is an image of my bear. He's actually in my current studio, but he's been with me for a long time. I call him Grin and Barrett for obvious reasons. And I think he was, he became a figure in a lot of the work that I did with the big drawings, figure drawings and big paintings. But first I had to finish up some pool paintings. And the last two I did were very large drawings. Um, they are uh, of my granddaughter, Nicole, and their dog, Cody, and of a neighbor named Craig who was jumping into the pool. Uh, I did these uh, at about 42 by 50. There, I had a big roll of Arches paper, and I just roll it. I would roll it out in the studio to cut it to the right size, and then spray it with water, and then just stick it on the wall. These are all charcoal with some small amounts of um, various other colors. The last one I did was Robin Ginger and Robin Ginger. This is our son Rob with our dog Ginger in the backyard. And I took it from a photograph, but when I looked at the photograph, when it, I didn't like just the single figure. Uh, it looked too static, and so I took it. I took the two. I doubled the figures, and that was a kind of challenge. I do like that. I wasn't projecting an image, and so I just had to figure out how to try to make this look the same with the two figures. And when it hung, it was at the Herberger in a show once, the Herberger Theater in Phoenix. And I overheard somebody asking, well, now are those twins? I thought that was very nice. And then, you know, again, you get interested in things and you get interested in other artists. And the artist I began to get interested in was Paula Rego, who is a Portuguese artist who is based, was based in London, I think still is, represented by Marlborough at the time, a very big international gallery. And I was amazed because she was using animals and female figures, and she was doing narrative art. And it hadn't occurred to me that that was even a possibility. And so I took that bear that was in my studio, and I began to inter have him interact with various figures. This is Caution Fall Down Bear. This is Carmen Miranda meets Fall Down Bear. It's not a very good slide. It's not this red of painting. But um, again, it's he's in the way a lot. And Carmen Miranda was in an old movie and I liked her headdress and her, I mean her scarf and the and the little cherries there. I did this painting, uh, which I is actually a portrait of a marriage, I would say. This is my friend Martha 
who is handing off the binoculars to her husband, who's down below, but she's kind of ignoring him. And I thought that was uh, a nice description. Girl explains it to Bear. It's nobody I know, just that the girl is in control. And then the last of these very large paintings, and this one is probably 60 by 52, maybe, uh, is called Black Dog Will Get You. I was getting interested in Egyptian, the, the fact that Phoenix is a desert, that Arizona is a desert. And so I took the black dog, which is Anubis, and I put the monkey in the fez and the girl with the Egyptian collar. And I began to try to say something about aging. And I think at the time, um, I was beginning to think about maybe I needed to really get going with painting and do a lot more. And, uh, and work had gotten very heavy. So I was thinking about change again. At that time, we then moved. We, had, we moved to Oracle. We built a house there. Uh, we had originally thought we would use it as a vacation home, but then lived there, decided to live there permanently. And America went to war. And so I did these two little small paintings there, uh, acrylic on board. And they were just a little joke, sort of, not a kind of unhappy joke about what, what the U.S. was doing in the Middle East. And while I actually, at my new home, we built a studio, and so I have an off-site studio. But while it was being built, I uh, actually did some drawings in ink, two colors of ink pen, and it was just a little story about coming to this new place. So this is Cinderella in Tombstone. My mother was ill at the time, and so I did a lot of things with the bear about uh, doctors and check his vitals. The crack up was about maybe stopping doing things. Uh, here I had scalpel, please, and heat stroke. And then I began to transfer them to oil on canvas. Um, I took, I started telling stories. And I used the bear and toys and jaguars in telling the story. Here is Yeehaw. Uh, I was just happy. I think that's about me being happy in a new place and having a full time a studio and doing art full time. I began to incorporate to toys in the paintings. We had a collection of wind up toys, and I just assigned myself uh, trying to do the seven deadly sins. I think I only did five, but this one was wrath. Uh, I liked puppeting. I liked the idea of people being, you know, manipulated. Uh, it, I thought it was kind of a, an interesting idea. And of course, the skeleton is from all the things that you see in uh, Mexican art. This is sloth, get up, star, every mother's nightmare. Um, this is mirror, mirror, vanity, and I think it's a bit of a Cinderella story with Cinderella working with the iron and the monkey looking in the mirror. Um, this is Lust, Easy Rider, the duck uh, viewing this girl, and uh, the duck will appear again and again. I use that duck a lot. I put the bear on um, on a unicycle. Sometimes I think these are uh, motivated by telling the uh, changeability of life and how rickety it is sometimes. And here is Manipulate. When I began to use the toys, um, I used, this is Chicky, Big Boy and Chicky. That's a, that was a portrait of a, somebody's rooster that lives here in Oracle. Here's uh, like water off a duck's back. This was just a little assignment to see if I could actually suggest rain, I'd never painted it. And this is Duck, Dog, and the Spotted Frog. And I just wanted to stop for a minute and say that I think, uh, I haven't talked much about composition, but I, and I don't normally paint, and I had not been normally painting in such a vertical, or I'm sorry, a horizontal format. But here, I think I wanted clearly to get the duck going out of the picture. And the dog is behind that particular toy animal, Pops. And then this was actually a monkey I made into a man. 
but he winds up and he's saying stop. So they're all leaving the picture plane and going on a journey. But I needed something to stop your eye, and so I just put in a spotted frog. I have no frogs, but I look them up. I do that a lot. I look for images in, uh, I never try to copy anything specific. I just want to know what something looks like so I can alter it to fit into the picture. And so I think that this uh, is a way of solving problems when you have a composition. I sometimes would do a painting based on something I'd experienced, and if you've been in a dust storm around here, you know that it comes up fast, it's dark, and it's dirty. And so I just crammed everything I could think of, all the toys, into this particular painting. This is actually in a museum in Peoria. I did Tumble and Turn, which I started out as one. Uh, the left-hand side was the painting. I thought it was complete, and when I looked at it, it was so tight. I asked Fred Soto, who does custom straight stretching in Tucson, if he'd make me a second side and make it into a diptych. And uh, then I added the other parts. And the fish on the feet, actually at the time I was doing a little clay, and so that fish uh, is something that I have in my studio. I made him. Um, and then he's th he thinks he is Zeus. The, the, this is about the U.S. Often I'll put little bits of if we're at war or we're in trouble. So you can see that there are some guns and there are some airplanes and, this, and Zeus is going to throw us a thunderbolt. Um, and during that time I also was using a Jaguar. When we moved to Oracle, I began to follow the Northern Jaguar Project on Instagram, and I started this painting with a bear in the girl's lap, but the, the image didn't work, and the bear became, well, I called it a leopard. Can the leopard change his spots? But essentially it was a Jaguar, and after that I began to incorporate the Jaguar in all these narrative pieces. So here is K. Permita El Hawar, uh, crossing the border. Here is Toma Awa, again about the border, and was in Borderlands, the Borderlands show in Northern Arizona, the museum there. Again, you can see I'm using pattern, and of course I had not liked using the, did not like the restrictions of the dots that I'd used, and yet again, I'm using pattern. So it comes back. It's like riding a bike. You never forget anything. My husband and I had a 50th wedding anniversary, so this was in that honor. And the girl's dress is from a photographer, Martin Chambi, who was a Peruvian photographer in the 20s and 30s and did some wonderful images of weddings in Lima. And this was the style of brides at that time. And then water comes back, of course. I guess I can't get very far away from it. So here is All at Sea with the jaguar stuck in a way too small uh, little bucket. And the figure at the left is actually my grandson, Scott, and it I fit him in there. That's as much as I could see of him. So in the composition, I decided he had to be looking out and that he would be the corner in this composition. Here is Now What, also again with a lot of... Um, imagery that I, I mean the boats for example I would look at boats and and there is the buoy that I told you about earlier that I used as an outtake in some smaller paintings. Here is in the drink the children are coming to the surface and everything else is in trouble. The dog is jumping, the cat is being tipped over, the sea lion is barking and I put those rubber duckies in because I like them and I think they're funny. Here is I See You, and in this one I'm having almost every uh, in image look at you. The duck, the sea lion, Scott again in one of his, uh, doing his um, snorkeling, the fish, but the two main characters are looking in opposite directions, and I'm not sure what that means, but it obviously probably means something. This is Shave and a Shine. Um, here I liked being able to change scale. The girl's in control, clearly, um, but the, the younger girl down at the feet of the jaguar 
is way too small for the for the compared to the jaguar and the and the big female and i it allowed me to play around with scale which i liked very much and then the imp in the background is just uh, maybe a little threatening. He's got a lot going on there, that Jaguar. This is Dance. Um, it's owned by Christopher and Ann Lusick. Uh, and here, I we had seen dancers in Peru, and so I took that and began to show the girl uh, interacting with the Jaguar. There's a little bit of a, a maybe even a, a bullfighter in it. I, I hadn't thought of that until I just looked at it now. This is Last Tango. I was trying to look at a girl's life, and I think in many ways I uh, incorporated a lot of what happens with women. There's the girl uh, waiting to be asked to dance. There's the girl dancing with the dog, Zorro, possibly. There's uh, She's connected with a cat, and there's a lot of stuff going on there. And in the background, she's pregnant and dancing with her husband. Uh, and I, uh, one, a friend looked at this and said, well, I know what the dog in the background is doing. Um, he's looking on. He's hoping he can dance with someone. And I thought that was really a lovely um, way of looking at this. I took the cat into the you know, tub time, splish splash, and also into getting his whiskers cut. I was... Uh, I took a lot of this out of a salon I went to in Tucson, Robert Markley's salon. Um, so I like to use imagery that I see and then com sort of combine it in ways that aren't, that where they wouldn't normally uh, belong or happen. And then here is Never Gamble with the Gypsy Queen. Sometimes I'll look around to see what somebody long before me has done and use that as a jumping off point for a painting. And in this case, this is based on Hieronymus Bosch's um, <laughs> This is the uh, boat uh, with all the people gambling, doing all the wrong things that Bosch had. He called it, and of course I can't think of the name, um, Ship of Fools. And this is a Ship of Fools. The children are being um, ignored. Uh, the cat is drinking and pretending not to. The pig is dumping money on them. Uh, Bosch used his paintings to as a morality play. And I don't know, I got that uh, gypsy queen going and I just liked the look on her face. Uh, and so I completed this painting and one other called Somebody Save the Cat. Again, a ship of fools, uh, but in this case, uh, the jaguar is based on an image of a leopard in a, that had fallen into a well in India. I just happened to see it. And the terror on that cat's face was so great, I put him into this painting so that he could at least climb the, the ladder. And again, everything is going on and people are ignoring each other. And that was the message. I think it was the message for Bosch. And then here we are the last of the jaguar paintings and you can see the jaguar is about ready to leave the image he's going on to his own thing it's called showtime uh, the muse the girl that's doing the hair for the man with the comb over is uh, the headdress is based on a vermeer painting and i sort of think this is an artist and the artist is a little afraid but he's going to have to get going and then I began to do a whole new series. And I think Showtime was an image that led me to do that. Uh, what happened, I, I got stuck in traffic. Uh, I was riding shotgun in, a, in our car, and we were traveling a lot in the Southwest. And we got stuck at the I-19 checkpoint. And I thought, wow, I haven't been here. I haven't seen what's going on that is part of the border. And so I thought, well, uh, this would be very interesting. I was getting interested in structures again. I was getting interested in imagery that wasn't animals and girls. And I thought this would be a good jumping off point. And in 2020, I recorded a studio view for uh, something I was going to do at the Herberger Theater. And I thought I'd play it right now so you can just see what my current studio looks like. This is the one in Oracle that we built 
in 2005. Every morning I come in here. Well, I don't seem to be able to make it work. So I'm going to just tell you that I took you in to look at some of the paperwork I work on as I do my, oh, I'm sorry. Maybe, well, as I do my um, drawings, I often use craft paper and then I paint in acrylic, black ac acrylic paint. And that's a way for me to do the first pass at uh, trying to take an image and begin to convert it to a painting. Uh, let's see if I can get this going. Every morning. I nope, I can't. So I'm going to stop that and move on to some of the paintings I did that year, in starting 2019 and then 2020. This is Checkpoint I-19 northbound. And this is only a tiny amount of how crowded that checkpoint was. This is north, going north from Nogales on the way to Tucson, and it is full of commerce. That was the thing that struck me most and got me interested. And you can see I've inc incorporated the car dashboard in this painting so that you could actually see I'm looking out uh, toward the long line of traffic. I was in a show in Yuma at the Yuma Art Center, and early in the morning we went back through the checkpoint I-8 eastbound so uh, this is kind of what you see. You see uh, lots of lights and you see lots of uh, all kinds of highway uh, cones and you also see speed limit signs. Lots of things to tell you what to do. And then of course what happened is uh, we got shut down and because of the pandemic. And so in about April of 2020, uh, we just went on a driving trip on 80, I, Arizona 82, and this is the checkpoint on Arizona 82. Um, it's called Working Dog Ahead, although I left, I didn't want the words on the signs, but that's what one of the signs said, so I just incorporated that as the title. These rural checkpoints are very strange because they're and oddly bucolic, and yet there's always a dog there, and there are all these lights, and there are all these cameras. It's, it's an odd um, kind of effect. On that same trip on Arizona 82, we went down to Patagonia. We saw all the school buses parked because all the schools had been closed. I called this one last summer. Uh, there was high fire danger, that fire sign there. Uh, that's what that really is. It usually would have an arrow to indicate how bad the fire, what the fire danger is. So I combined a number of, Im number of images from there. And then we were at San Luis Port of Entry. Uh, this was in December of 2019. Uh, this is what you see. Uh, when the border is active, this is what goes on. People use it for commerce. There are cars stacked up. There are people crossing in both directions. There are, there are lots of fences, and people go across the border to buy from Mexico, and they shop in the U.S., and then they cross home, and they carry their, their purchases with them. From that place, from San Luis, I decided I'd do a, a kind of focus on the cameras, because the cameras are everywhere. And everything has been added. You can see that it didn't start out that way and that they just kept adding cameras. I looked to see what these cameras are. And it's impossible to find out what each of them does. One of my friends said he thought it, it looked almost comical and uh, it, like a cartoon. And I suppose you could see them uh, that way. But it's prepare to stop. Uh, this is all about recording you. You're not allowed to take photos there. Um, so you have to stand way off to get anything. Um, and I just thought it was an interesting statement on what the border's like. Then across the border from San Luis, across the California state border, is Fraser Algodones. And a lot of people go there from California to have their teeth worked on. It's called Molar City. And again, here is an old, old border crossing 
with all kinds of additions, lots of extra uh, extra fencing. People go back and forth. Cars are parked you can't get through. There are these big uh, cement berms. And I just tried to make this an interesting functional painting uh, of what it looked like. Here's another one, ramps and railings with people crossing. Uh, it's the U.S. Port of Entry. And one of the last I did from there is barriers. And this is what it looks like. It's You see lots and lots of razor wire, lots of barriers, um, old buildings, additions. Um, wherever anybody thought somebody could get through, they put in a new set of fencing. This is what it really looks like. Um, and then this is my work in progress, and I showed you one of the paper drawings that I do, uh, or actually, you know, it's painted, but I call them drawings, uh, to get an idea of where I'm going to go with the imagery. And this is the first pass that I did. Uh, this painting is uh, 42 by 38, maybe, maybe a little larger. And uh, I've been working on it now for uh, the last several months from time to time. I don't work steadily on most of these paintings. Um, this is oil on canvas. This is from San Luis. And this was during the time when people could cross. So the two men on the, on the uh, left-hand side had done their shopping. And they were, going to, they were heading back to Mexico. And the man on the right is waiting for the light so he can begin his walk back into Mexico. I think this border crossing series is going to go on for a long time, um, at least five years, because I have other things I'd like to cover. Uh, I would like to understand the blended culture of the border and the day-to-day -day activities. That's mostly what I'm looking for. Borders are porous. We speak Spanish in Tucson because Mexico is right across the border. So I think there's a lot to say. And uh, it's going to keep me busy, which I think is good. Thank you all for listening to me. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I'll answer any questions.